I also want to touch on just the um, uh, on on your your title because um, mm-hmm. I think you know over the over the past five or six years we've heard a lot about uh, wealth inequality, uh, but you you both sort of qualify um, the the nature of the inequality that you're dealing with in in two different ways. One, you're saying that there is a particularly virulent inequality uh, in that it's toxic. And also that the problem with inequality is not simply a social justice one, but a functional one for society. W- walk us through uh, those elements of that, of that particularly toxic inequality. Sure. So I wanted a title that uh, was able to distinguish uh, where we are now in the United States, and I would actually argue where we've been headed since the early 1970s. From, from our earlier points in time. Um, and the distinguishing features for me are really, it, it's several fold. Well, toxic inequality really is a, an unprecedented convergence of historic highs in inequality in both income and wealth. And that's, that's pretty well known and, and extremely well and compellingly documented. But that's also combined with uh, the United States being in an era of stalled family mobility, where economic mobility, to the extent it still exists, has gotten to to the anemic stage, shall we say, and families are are really having to uh, to navigate that by literally putting more paid workers in the workforce just to stay uh, just to try and stay in the same spot. And that th- those intersect with a widening racial wealth gap, which is something I have been doing a lot of a lot of work. Uh, both on the scholarly side and on the advocacy activist side for, for a couple of uh, decades now. That racial wealth gap, the way we look at it and measure it, following the same set of families, has tripled uh, between 1984 and 2013. All of those, if you will, against the backdrop of changing racial and, and ethnic demographics in the United States and increasing pandering to racial anxiety, and, and that, for me, is what distinguishes where we are in the United States today. And I, you know, I, I don't want any and anybody to quote me, um, but in a way, inequality is not the issue. Inequality is always with us. The, the issue, it seems to me, is the threshold, the danger, uh, how it comes about, and and the segments of the society that face it. So that's why I wanted to distinguish it and come up with uh, uh, the phrase "toxic inequality." And certainly, um, in uh, the the I guess the the post Civil War era. Well, I don't know if this is the case, but the idea that from 1984 to now we have seen a racial inequality uh, wealth gap uh, increase at that rate seems to me to be. I mean, I don't I mean, put that in context in in American history because I mean, obviously. Um, you know, when you're talking uh, pre-Civil War, pre-Reconstruction. Uh, but I would imagine, like, the, the rate of increase over the course of 30 years, that seems to me to be pretty stunning. It is. And, and I think there are two, there are really two main facets of that, if, if you will. Um, one is, you know, if, if, as a scholar, if you will, if you were to, to take the hypothetical question, of uh, all right, so mid 1980s, uh, we're 20 years after major, hard-fought, successful national pieces of civil rights legislation around finances, around housing, around businesses, around access to higher education. One might presume, um, as some people do, that the United States has become that post-racial society where race has less and less meaning in in terms of of families and individuals' outcome, um, but when, you, when we put that to the empirical test and, and ask the question, well, what's happened to the racial wealth gap? If the post-racial society contingent is correct, then whatever legacy, whatever his, history is delivered at that gap uh, in the mid-1960s should have stayed about relatively equal. The gap shouldn't increase or shouldn't narrow in any one way or another. But the, the data tell a very different story literally looking at the same set of families, and that's what's key here, the same set of families, that racial wealth gap grows in inflation-adjusted dollars from $84,000 in 1984 to $245,000 in in 2013. 
And what that represents to me is that when we talk about racial, material racial injustice in the United States, history and that legacy is really critical. But we also have to understand the, the contemporary drivers of it in terms of policy, in terms of our own inst- continuing institutional discrimination in the United States. And the other part of that is that while that gap grows, um, the financial wealth of African-American families in that same you know, 29-year period does in fact grow. So there, there's, there's success. It's not as if there's a, a stalling out, if you will. But the, the fact is that the wealth of the white community grows so much more quickly that that gap actually widens threefold. And, and I would imagine that's going to affect the purchasing power, too, on some level, right? Or, are we, or is, that, is that controlled? In other no, words, no. That, yeah, you're, you're right. It, it, it does affect pur- purchasing power, power very, very greatly. Okay. Because we're talking, we're talking about dis, uh, so-called discretionary income and how that's converted to wealth or not. So the, the story that you tell is, I mean, um, is about intergenerational wealth uh, in, in some respects. But I imagine over the course when we're talking about 30 some odd years, um, is that a function of how much wealth is tied into housing? Mm. And I mean, it, and, and I, it seems to me that there's like sort of a um, it, it's a. It's a combination of both the impact of, of how you're set up with intergenerational wealth and, 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 and how so often that wealth is a function of housing, and then what has happened to housing over the past 30-some-odd years. Sure, that's, that's, uh, that, that's pretty much right on. Um, I, I think a, a baseline piece of information here is that for the broad swath of, we can call them middle-class America, between the 20th and 80th percentile, where, where most of us are, uh, two-thirds of the wealth of that broad 60% in the middle is in the form of housing equity. It's not the fable that we're taught in, in Economics 101 about marginal propensities to save and consume and thrift and all that, uh, which is important for sure. But when you're talking about two-thirds of the wealth is in our home equity, that, that points us to uh, the institutions and the regulations and the financing around home ownership in the United States and, and the ways in which uh, uh, families receive uh, uh, help on their down payment and the ways in which uh, that, that wealth uh, can be passed along to subsequent generations. And, and uh, just uh, broadly speaking, just uh, our, the way our society sorts itself in some respects or is helped along to sort itself, like you say, by these, these policies. And I want to get to those, some major examples of that historically that have sort of begun that trend. I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, I had one experience that, you know, where I became sort of aware of of the the implications of intergenerational wealth, but in a sort of bastardized way. And I just, I, I don't know, I, I wanted to get your take on it before we go to some of those policy things. Sure. I, I had an opportunity to sit on a panel once uh, on a, a, a weekend cable show um, with a guy named Donahue Peebles, who is one of the top, I guess, uh, wealthiest African-Americans in the country. And uh, between breaks, we were having an argument about the uh, estate tax. And uh, he was saying and, uh, that the, the CBE, the Congressional Black Caucus, CBC, uh, supported, uh, this was back in 2012, I think, uh, re- you know, going back to mm-hmm. either Bush mm-hmm. era uh, estate tax, and he was putting it in the form of, we have finally arrived, speaking of African Americans, we need the ability to pass down our wealth to our, our, you know, through generational. This is a major problem. And I thought, like, yes, that is a major problem, but it's not going to be solved by just making your family rich, uh, your kids rich. But that, that is, I mean, so he was half right, it seems to me. Uh, the solution, though, is more, you know, uh, the estate tax is not going to be one that's going to broadly help everyone, is it? No, uh, no, 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 it's not. Um, so we, we could, we, we, uh, that, that rings one of my most passionate bells here uh, because it's, the estate tax is so symbolic and, and the way the, the current administration and past administrations have, have monkeyed around with it and, and tried to get rid of it. So the, the, the fact of the matter is uh, $10.4 million can be passed along uh, tax-free from a couple 
to uh, to decedents in in any fashion and any form that they desire. Uh, literally zero zero tax on that. Um, and and so uh, 10.4 million dollars for an individual. It's it's you know it's like 5.2 million now, and that's indexed to inflation because you have to we have to protect rich people after all, and and their their sons and daughters and, and grandchildren. Um, and and even then the tax uh, at is uh, I believe is now at a 35 percent uh, estate tax level, and that's for dollar one over the 10.4 million. Right. It's not of that 10.4 million. So to begin with, um, uh, uh, in in communities that have not had historical opportunities to acquire and generate and build much wealth in the past, there is still ample opportunity to pass along a huge lot of it to to descendants. Now, the second part of that for me is that, you know, who are we talking about in the estate tax? Um, 18 out of every 10,000 deaths in the United States are eligible to pay the estate tax. That's what we're talking about, 18 out of 10,000. Um, and, and it becomes this huge national, national issue, which I think, unfortunately, we're, we're about to, to deal with it once again in the United States right. under Trump. Hi, folks. Sam Cedar here. We still need your help on our Patreon page. YouTube ads have come back, but not nearly as much as we had before. So if you can help us out, any little bit helps. Head over to our Patreon page right at this URL, and you'll help us keep helping you by making videos.